Good morning. My name is Ken Thomas, Regional Volunteer Director for AARP. And on behalf of AARP Florida, I would like to welcome you to the Your Voice, Your Vote, Vote Safely discussion with the Florida Secretary of State, Laurel Lee, and other distinguished panelists. One of AARP's key priorities for this election year is to ensure Floridians are aware of their voting options and how they can vote safely in a year that brought us COVID-19. And while the coronavirus may have put large parts of our lives on hold, there's one event that will still happen, the 2020 election. To that end, we're working diligently with local election officials to ensure all Floridians understand the process and know what to expect in a time of change due to the pandemic. Today, you'll learn about your voting options and we'll explain the available methods to help you identify the way to vote that best suits your needs. If you have questions on voting from home, voting early, or voting safely on election day, you're in the right place. And we have the state's top election official with us to, today to answer them. Here with us today as part of this team effort to educate voters is Nancy Hosey, the Florida Retired Educators Association President. FREA is partnering with AARP Florida to provide voters 50 plus with information on how to vote safely. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you, Ken. It's great to be here. Um, as president of FREA, I'm proud to represent the 9,000 plus members of our, or, uh, of our association, which is an offshoot of the National Retired Teachers Association. And of course, you know that that was the first foundation of what we now know as AARP. Our organizational mission modeled after NRTA is to protect retired educators' physical, mental, and financial health goals through legislative action. As part of that work, FREA has worked closely with AARP State Office on many fronts from advocacy, community outreach, volunteerism, and education work. FREA's ever-present goal is to educate Floridians of all ages on the reasons to protect retired teachers. Our goal here today is to shine a light on the importance of the retiree voter, who, a key voting demographic. In 2018, 64% of Floridians aged 50 plus voted, and in 2016, that figure was 57%. This makes ensuring that they know their voting options a critical issue. And when it comes to elections, many of our members are longtime volunteers for voter registration and as poll workers in their communities, making us proud to join AARP and the Secretary of State today as part of this important effort. It is my pleasure to introduce Jeff Johnson, AARP's Florida State Director, who leads the state office in their efforts of advocating for the 50 plus and the many ways they can safely vote. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Nancy, and good morning, Ken, as well. Great to see you both. Wonderful to have this opportunity to work with the Florida Retired Educators Association. As Nancy said, we are uh, we are cousins, if you will, both founded by the same person, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrus. We're going to be talking with Secretary of State Laurel Lee in just a few moments about how you can vote safely in Florida. And what I'll mention to those who are uh, participating in this is that if you have a question for Secretary Lee, there is a chat box uh, on your screen that you can use to put in your question and we will try to get to as many of those as possible because Florida voters do have a lot of questions. AARP has been conducting polls of older voters, 50 plus voters, and actually a couple of polls that are for 18 and over, so all voters. And one of the things that I think is really important to emphasize is that people are confident in our election process here in Florida, and people are excited about the opportunity to vote. The last survey that we did showed that 93% of respondents have trust in our electoral process here in Florida and, and in our voting systems. And the other thing that I think we're gonna be talking a good bit about today 
is that they are aware of uh, several different ways that they can vote. And we've seen a number of older voters who are changing perhaps from what they've done in the past and how they plan to cast their ballot here in 2020. So one of the surveys we did recently showed that almost half, 49% of the voters that we spoke to said that they plan to use the mail to cast their ballot. We had another 26% who said that they were planning to vote early, the early voting in their community. And then there were another 24% who plan to show up on November 3rd on election day at their polling place. And those are stats that I suspect our distinguished guest today, Florida Secretary of State Laurel Lee is not surprised by. Secretary of State Laurel Lee was appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis as Florida's 36th Secretary of State and began serving in that role in February of 2019. Secretary Lee has previously served as the circuit court judge in Florida's 13th Judicial Circuit in Hillsborough County. And prior to serving as a judge, Secretary Lee was an assistant United States attorney in the Middle District of Florida. Welcome, Secretary Lee. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, and I am so uh, thrilled to get to be here uh, to speak to the AARP and the FERA. So I appreciate the invitation very much. Uh, and of course, our topic here today is very timely and important. So I want to briefly touch on three things today and then leave some time at the end for your questions. I'll start by speaking a bit about why your vote and your voice matter. Uh, then how, uh, how to vote in Florida, what are our voting options that are available, and then finally, what we're doing to ensure the integrity of the election and also to protect you and your vote at the polls. So I'll start with just a little bit of an overview of Florida. Of course, we are the third most populous state in the nation. And one thing that makes Florida very unique is that we are what people refer to as a purple state. In other words, the demographic of our voters divides very closely between the major political parties. So what that means is that uh, a candidate from either political party can easily win an election statewide in any given year. And our elections are often decided by absolutely razor thin margins. We have a history of those uh, in even uh, the most major elections in Florida. So what that means for our voters is in, in a very real sense, every single vote matters. And sometimes our elections will be decided by just a handful of voters making that extra effort. So our key priority at the Department of State this year has been to make sure that we reach the largest number of voters possible to encourage them to get registered and make sure that those voters know how to vote and what their options are. So of course, uh, the uh, Persons over 65 are more than 20% of our population in Florida, and voters over 45 years old have outpaced younger voters uh, in the last 40 years in terms of their level of participation in election, even when the youth vote is very excited about a candidate. So you all are really a critical constituency to be sure that uh, we have provided the very best and most accurate information uh, to ensure that you have everything that you need when you head to the polls. So in Florida, we're fortunate to have three voting options that are available for all voters. Specifically, we have vote by mail, we have early voting, and we have in-person voting. So I'll spend just a moment on vote by mail. We've been hearing, of course, a much larger national dialogue about the vote by mail process. Uh, and it is important for Florida voters to understand that this is something, vote by mail, is something that we know how to do in Florida and we know how to do vote by mail with a very high level of integrity. We have had voting by mail in some form or fashion in our state since 1917 and in much the same present form uh, for close to 20 years. We have a system that includes important safeguards to ensure that ballots are mailed to registered voters uh, and that they are returned from that voter. 
including uh, voter must request a vote by mail ballot. We don't just send them out to everyone on the voter rolls. Uh, and also when that ballot is returned to the supervisor of elections office, it's verified and checked to be sure that the signature actually correlates to information that we have on file for that voter. So we have some very important safeguards to ensure that a ballot goes to its intended recipient and that it comes back from its intended recipient. So I uh, would very strongly encourage you all uh, that voting by mail in Florida is safe, it is effective, it is reliable, uh, and our postal service here is also very familiar uh, with how to manage a large volume of vote by mail ballots. So in other states, this isn't the case. We have other states around the country right now who in response to the coronavirus pandemic are trying to develop new or different methods of voting for their citizens. And we're very fortunate in Florida that we are very prepared to uh, conduct an election that includes all of these very methods for Florida voters. For voters who prefer to vote in person, we have early voting and election day voting. And one thing that's very important to know about our in-person voting is that we've been working very hard to ensure that important safety protocols are present that protect election workers and voters. Your local election officials will ensure that personal protective equipment is there, social distancing is observed, and that precinct locations are kept sanitized in between voters who come through. Uh, one of the things that Governor Ron DeSantis did in support of accommodating the pandemic as it relates to elections was directing our state and local emergency management offices to ensure that supervisors of election had access to any sort of PPE, hand sanitizer, or sanitation equipment that they required. So you will see very close attention to those types of measures in all polls for voters who prefer to vote in person. We did have a very successful primary election in August, and we saw those measures implemented. One, uh, for those who are interested in what is likely going to be the, the quickest, uh, avoiding lines, avoiding crowds. Uh, I commend to you early voting if you want to vote in person. Uh, that is, I typically vote early. And in, in my experience, there's almost never even a line. It's an easy way to walk in, vote, and head on out. So, uh, but very important to understand that all of those three methods are available. Another important note about Florida, is we do not have an excuse or a reason that has to be required for a vote by mail ballot. Anyone, any Florida voter is entitled to request a vote by mail ballot and there's still plenty of time to do that. Uh, voting by mail is already underway. Supervisors have sent out a large volume of vote by mail ballots already. They're already coming back, uh, but there's plenty of time. You can request a vote by mail at, ballot be mailed to you all the way up until October 24th, uh, and you can continue to request those ballots in person uh, even after that date. For those who may have concerns about their vote by mail ballot being returned timely, uh, also be aware that you can, if you get a vote by mail ballot, uh, but, you, but you haven't filled it out, you haven't mailed it back and you're concerned, maybe it's too close to election day and you wanna be sure that it gets there timely. Uh, you can also drop that ballot off at any early voting location. Uh, supervisors of elections in some communities are also setting up additional drop boxes where those ballots can be delivered. And you can take it back to your supervisor of elections office even on election day. So um, those are some important things for you to know there. Uh, another thing that is important to share is the investments that we've made in election security, because I think those go right to the heart of voter confidence in the integrity of our election. I was absolutely thrilled to hear the statistic at the beginning that 93% had confidence and trust in our elections infrastructure. Uh, that is something we're working so hard to promote and to communicate about everything that we've done. Back in 2019, Governor DeSantis directed me to conduct 
a review of our elections infrastructure statewide and identify any areas, not just at the state level, but down at the counties as well, where we might have a risk or vulnerability uh, from our cybersecurity and elections infrastructure perspective. And we have done that. We went down to each of Florida's 67 counties and worked in collaboration with each supervisor of elections to conduct an election specific risk assessment on their networks and infrastructure. And we've worked with them in partnership since then to ensure that any vulnerabilities that were identified have been mitigated or addressed. So it's the first time that we have ever had that kind of statewide picture uh, and the level of collaboration we have to address anything uh, that was identified. Our governor and our state legislature have both made critical investments in election security and elections infrastructure. So we have a stronger position and a stronger network than we ever have uh, before. Another piece on election security that's important to note, you know, we hear a lot nationally about the phrase uh, foreign interference in elections. And when we talk about foreign interference, it's important to distinguish between uh, direct threats and, if, and attempts to infiltrate uh, and penetrate our elections related networks. Uh, those do happen. We defend against those types of threats every single day. Uh, but we also have uh, another important and distinct type of threat, uh, and that refers to misinformation and disinformation. This is a key part of preparation for this year's election. Uh, we want all Floridians to be aware of the danger of misinformation and disinformation and what to do uh, to try to be protected from being influenced by that. Uh, what it refers to basically is uh, incorrect or misleading information that's put out there, usually on the internet, often by social media, that's intended to affect voter behavior. A classic example might be uh, someone's Facebook feed provides information that election day has been moved to Wednesday or that your usual precinct has been moved and closed and you've got to drive 20 miles away to get to a different precinct. Um, so we do expect that type of thing is going to happen. And what we want all voters to do is know that it's imperative to go to trusted sources for information about elections. That would be your local supervisor of elections office the Department of State website, or even our federal law enforcement partners like the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security. Any question that you have about your precinct location, where to go, what you need to bring, all of that, gather that information, have your plan ready, your plan ready before you leave the house to go vote. That information is on your supervisor of elections website or you can call their office to get that information. They are there to help. We are all here to help and want to be sure that we equip voters with all of the information they need. Uh, there have been some changes to precinct locations uh, as a consequence of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, for example, we uh, used to have some polling locations located within assisted living facilities. Uh, obviously, we closed those and moved those uh, for the safety of the residents. We didn't want to bring in a large volume of people from the public into those types of facilities. So there have been some changes. Uh, you may have already voted in the primary and figured out uh, and validated where your location is, but if not, we encourage you to check that uh, before you head out to vote. Uh, a note on our federal partners, they are also really critical in helping us identify relevant intelligence information uh, and combat that misinformation and disinformation that we spoke about before. Uh, we've engaged with a voter outreach campaign uh, that we hope will reach all of you uh, that is to designed to prepare voters to be on the lookout uh, and be conscious consumers of this type of information uh, so that we know that they are prepared with everything they need. One final thing we've done this year that I think is, is really important and, and, and something that I'm very excited about is for the first time ever, the state engaged in a complete voter outreach, voter registration campaign. We have contacted every single potentially eligible but unregistered Floridian to encourage them to register to vote and provide information about the three voting options that are available to them. So I'm hoping that this year 
will bring record numbers of registered voters and voter participation. So in closing, one thing I always try to say is this, uh, we understand elections are partisan, but elections administration is not. And the Department of State and your local supervisor of elections are there to serve all Florida voters, regardless of your party affiliation, the candidates that interest you, uh, we are there to serve all Floridians. So know that we are a resource and we'll get you anything you need to help facilitate uh, your voting and your participation in our democracy. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Secretary Lee. You've given us a lot of information in a short period of time, and so I really appreciate you sharing all that with us. We do have the opportunity for people to ask questions in that chat box, and our team is going through to pull those out, and I've got a couple for you, but before I do, and as people are still thinking about all that you've said and the questions that they may have, I'm going to bring back Nancy from the Florida Retired Educators Association because she had a question I know even before we got started. I want to make sure we get a chance to address that. So Nancy, can you go ahead and ask your question? Okay, thank you. And I want to say as a poll worker myself, since I retired, I can uh, ensure you that we've been made aware of all these things that you talk about in our poll worker training. So I'm feeling safe and secure as that goes. As retired educators, many of us have had uh, educated individuals with disabilities. And as retirees, there's a lot of us who have mobility issues. How do people of any age get assistance with voting if they have a disability? That is a wonderful question. And I am glad to report that Florida law entitles those with disabilities to ask for assistance at the polls and when voting by mail. So if you're going to the polls and you have a disability or require some special accommodation or assistance, each polling location should have an ADA compliant machine uh, to help you vote. The Division of Elections is also working to try to make vote by mail more accessible for individuals with disabilities, uh, such as blindness. We recently approved a technology for an assistive tool called, called OmniBallot, uh, which five counties will be testing out during the November election. Uh, based on what we learn, we hope to have this and other technologies available for voters in the coming years who uh, wish to vote by mail. But every single voter, uh, when you arrive at the polls is entitled to the assistance that they require. So be sure to talk to your poll workers when you get there. Uh, don't be hesitant to ask for assistance. Uh, that is what they are all there to provide. Great. And thank you for your answer. And Nancy, thank you for being a poll worker as well, because uh, we certainly depend on your service uh, to make all of this work. Uh, Secretary Lee, we've got a fair number of questions already from folks who um, uh, kind of cover the waterfront. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, hit you with them one at a time. So John asked, how can I confirm that my vote is counted? Is there a way for folks to check on their vote? If, and I would assume this is especially true if you voted using a mail-in ballot. Is there a way to yes. go through and confirm? There's, there is. So you can actually track your vote by mail ballot. Uh, if you request it, you can track it. Uh, your supervisor of elections website will have the ability for you to track that ballot to see if it's on the way, to see when it should be received. Uh, that's also something that gives a lot of comfort to voters uh, who, who may be concerned about their ballot being intercepted or not being received. You can track it on the way and track it on the way back to be sure it returns back to the supervisor's office. If there is any issue, a couple of things to share also about voting by mail. First off, it is critical, all vote by mail ballots must be signed on the outside of the envelope. That signature is then compared to the signature that's on file back at the Supervisor of Elections office. That's one of the ways that we validate the integrity of our vote by mail process. If there is any problem with that, if a ballot comes back without a signature or the signature doesn't appear to match, our supervisors of elections will immediately reach out to voters to give them a chance to correct whatever is the problem with the vote. So if you're voting by mail, I do encourage you to vote 
early to return your ballot uh, in plenty of time and, and get it back. I know the Postal Service is also encouraging voters to uh, use a service that they refer to as informed delivery. Anyone can sign up online with the Postal Service and that will not only give you information about your ballot, it will also alert you every day about what to expect in your mailbox. So that's another really important tool. A final thing about um, those who are particularly interested in how our tabulation machines work and, and how we know votes are counted, um, we do every election something that we refer to as logic and accuracy testing. This is a pre-election audit of all voting systems, all, all vote tabulating machines with, that is open to the public. And essentially, the supervisors all run a, a test, a mock test election to ensure that the equipment is working properly and that the votes are tabulated correctly. That's open to the public. So it is one of the most interesting and effective ways. Uh, if you're curious about voting equipment and how we know it works, I highly encourage you to check out that pre-election audit that happens uh, in every county. So uh, this, apart from working as a poll worker, which is really, I think, the greatest, most wonderful way to learn about everything you ever wanted to know about our elections, uh, that is a second way that is really a great opportunity to uh, give yourself a little more information about why you should feel confident in what we do. That's great. And, you know, I have, like you, I have in recent elections voted early, but this last time I voted by mail. And as the stories were coming out about how you need to make sure you sign your ballot, I thought, ooh, I don't remember if I did that. So I went back and checked, as you said, on the supervisor of election site here, you can you can look up your last election. So in the August primary, I was able to see, yep, vote counted. So it, that gave me real peace of mind. And and I think you, you cited this in, in your comments. If even though I received the ballot through the mail, you don't have to mail it back in. You can deliver it to the supervisor's office, and um, and that's what I did. And it was you know inside the office at a very clear drop-off site, and again the vote was was counted according to the system. So it gave me a lot of confidence in that as a way to go um, going forward. And and actually it kind of leads to the next question about the different options for voting early. So Donna asked if you received a mail-in ballot, so you requested a mail-in ballot and you received it, but you decided you actually want to go vote early at early voting instead. What do you do with the mail-in ballot? How, how do you, you know, obviously you cannot vote twice. Um, so, so how do you manage that? You got it. And, and that's exactly right. If you did request a vote by mail ballot and then decide, no, nope, you know what, I'm feeling good. I want to go to the polls. That's absolutely fine. So when your vote is recorded by voter record, uh, the, we know that immediately. So you can't vote again. So if, for example, if you went to the polls and voted early and then I know no one would do this, but if you then went home and you had your vote by mail ballot and tried to mail it in, it would be rejected. It wouldn't be counted. So we have an absolute track of who has already voted for all of these manners. It's, it's updated real time. Uh, so it's absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. If you get your vote by mail ballot and decide not to use it, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying I'm going to go to the polls instead. Again, the guiding principle just being everybody only votes once. And the, and the first ballot you cast is the one that counts. That's right. That's right. And they, you can't change it. The other thing that right that the other thing that I noticed was when you do vote early, whether it's through the mail or through early voting, you quit getting calls from campaigns, which is kind of a nice thing in and of itself. So uh, it shows that it's updated. It shows how quickly the campaigns are, are following the updated uh, vote tallies when when you see the call stop all of a sudden. Yes. Um, Jody asked a question, and it's a good one because we're hearing a lot of discussion about this nationally, but specifically in Florida, when are those mail-in votes actually counted? I know there's a lot of discussion that election results could be delayed around the country because many states can't start counting the mail-in votes until after the polls close on election day. Is that the case in Florida? That is such a great question. And because you're, you're absolutely right. One of the things that we're seeing as, as public interest in the election uh, elevates, we're seeing all of these national discussions. And, and absolutely, there are states around the country that are going to have, uh, they refer to election week or election month. Um, Florida, we're very fortunate. We, again, have an election code that I think has been very thoughtfully considered uh, for many years by our legislature. So vote by mail ballots are due by 7 p.m. on election day. 
Uh, so it is essential that if you have your vote by mail ballot that it is received, you can drop it off, uh, but it must be received, whether you send it by the mail or drop it off, by 7 p.m. on election day. Now, one thing that makes that distinct in Florida is that uh, we therefore, some, some states use postmarks uh, and other deadlines. So if they receive a large volume of vote by mail ballots, they may not be received until for days after the election. So a lot of secretaries of state are out there talking about how uh, they're unlikely to have results on election night. They're unlikely to have a sense of who won. Uh, I'm very optimistic that in Florida, uh, despite the very high amount of vote by mail that we're expecting, I'm very optimistic that we will still be able to have unofficial results likely on election night uh, as we typically do. On ballots and it's about that signature match that we talked about. Tom asked, how can you make sure that your signature matches the one that's on file at the at the supervisor's office? So if there is a problem, uh, you know, oftentimes they'll have a prior signature or even a signature that uh, depending on when and how you register to vote, it could be from your voter registration application or when you went last went to DHSMB. Uh, so the important thing to know there is that by statute, if there's any question, if, if they review your ballot and they don't think it's a match, you will be contacted immediately by your supervisor of election and given time to come in and uh, cure basically to come in and say, no, 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 that's me, that's my ballot, uh, and given time to fix that. Uh, that's another reason it's a good idea to get your ballot back early if you have any question. Um, another thing that's good is if you do vote in person, if you have any questions or concerns or you, or you, you need a little assistance or don't know what to do, uh, any of our election workers are there to help. They're a wonderful resource if you have any questions about how to fill out a ballot, uh, or you know where to where to go to stand or what to do or where to, they are there to help and they are go through very extensive thorough training uh, and and are there to be an assistance to you. Great, thanks. A little bit of a different topic in it, and I think it is a reflection of perhaps the tumultuous times in which we live. But Mark asked if there's a hotline if we encounter in intimidation or harassment or anything that that uh, makes us feel unsafe outside the polls, presumably on election day. Although I guess that could happen in early voting as well. Is there a, what recourse do people have if if uh, they encounter this? Which hopefully. They Yes, absolutely. So we operate two hotlines, uh, both in English and in Spanish. One is a voter assistance hotline. Uh, that, would, that would fall into our voter assistance hotline. If there's anything happening, it, whether it is a question about what to do or how to vote, any of the subjects we've covered today, uh, they're prepared to answer those questions. Any problems a voter is experiencing, uh, anything like that, we, we run a, a hotline through through the election period to make sure that voters have some place that they can call. Uh, we also have a fraud hotline, a, a special fraud hotline, if there's anything that you see going on that you think isn't right or that needs to be addressed or checked out. So the Department of State does have those resources available for all voters. We also have right. an election website as part of our voter outreach and voter education campaign. Uh, we've put up a website, FloridaElection2020.gov, that has much more, uh, if, you, if there are any of the subjects I mentioned today interest you, uh, we have a lot of information there, including some videos and things uh, about what to do and how to vote on that website as well. Wonderful. Thank you. And I'm sure we can get that website out to the folks who participated in, in this as well. Um, just a kind of a detailed question, but one that because AARP has been really active in advocating for residents in nursing homes and long term care facilities uh, to keep them safe from the coronavirus, while those facilities are beginning to open up to visitors in the past, what we understand is that many residents have had either volunteers from an organization or family members who have come and helped them with their ballots, let's say, if they have vision difficulties or, you know, just difficulties f filling it out. Are there plans to help ensure that those who are in those facilities and, and, and maybe not able to go to polling places have the opportunity to cast their vote safely? Yes. So, of course, for anyone who's in a nursing home or assisted living, living with any sort of mobility problems who doesn't wish to uh, vote in person, of course, we try to make sure that they understand and have access to 
um, the vote by mail process, oftentimes that's a very effective and useful tool for those uh, individuals to have to cast their ballot. Uh, and yes, uh, we do have options. I know sometimes uh, the staff, the facility, family members, others uh, help those residents fill out their ballots uh, and can in drop them off for them. Great. Great, thanks. Um, another question on the signature issue, and this is from Jose. It's a good question. What, is there criteria for disqualifying a ballot based on signatures? And he says this, but frankly, I could say this too. If I sign my name a hundred times, it's going to look a little bit different every time. How how does uh, how, you know how do uh, the election officials determine whether this is a match or not quite a match? Yes, and there absolutely are criteria and standards. So, and and I will say, I I think that if it is a um, a pretty liberal, you know, a, a process, uh, it does not need to be an exact form match to the signature that they have on file. We did conduct at the Department of State. We conducted a training. Uh, for all supervisors of election to talk about the types of things to be looking for in a signature match. Uh, and uh, one thing that's interesting, and, and again, this is something that, that uh, you know, if you look at some of the uh, supervisors of election and the information that they have about voting, um, the, oftentimes they're not signed at all, or uh, the signature doesn't seem like it could possibly have come from the same person. So the, uh, but importantly, again, remember that there is that cure period. So if you are concerned or you're worried your signature may have changed, uh, that there will be an opportunity in the in the unlikely event if it's signed that it's that it's rejected, uh, there will be an opportunity to correct that and make sure that your vote is counted. Great, great, thanks. Okay, uh, interesting question on mail-in ballots. Um, are they postage paid or do you have to put stamps on it? And if so, is there, uh, depending on how long the ballot can be, assuming that there could be local elections and referenda, is there a way to make sure you have the right amount of postage if you've got to mail it uh, with your own postage? Yes. So one thing to know is that the um, not all of the vote by mail ballots will be coming to you with prepaid postage. It depends on where you live. Uh, some of the supervisors of election were able to include that money in their budget. Uh, it is one of the things that was an allowable expense with the election related CARES Act dollars. So some supervisors were able to fund prepaid postage with CARES Act dollars. So some Floridians will receive their vote by mail ballot with return postage already there uh, and others will will not. So if you have any sort of challenge with knowing uh, how much postage is required, or if you don't have uh, the ability to either acquire or afford your own postage, uh, you should call your supervisor of elections office because they can walk you through several methods to get that ballot returned, both to, both how much postage you need to put on your particular ballot, depending on how they're, how long they are. That too isn't the same across the state because uh, some ballots you will see will be bilingual and trilingual. Uh, other parts of the state, they, they are not. Uh, so we have different ballot links in different parts of the state. So the amount of postage that's required depends on your particular ballot. So your supervisor of election can both inform you about what is required and then also give you some ideas and suggestions and alternatives if you're not able to afford that postage. Great, thank you. The, the, and by the way, just quick pause to say, again, really appreciate you spending the time to go through these questions because clearly voters have a lot of questions right now. And so it's wonderful to have you to be able to provide the answers. Um, so the, and this is a pretty specific one, actually, and it may be something, I don't know, that varies county by county. But somebody asks, uh, so I know we talked about how in Florida, mail-in ballots can be counted um, in advance to so that they'll be part of the initial count. So, so, but somebody asked, so let's say I drop off my mail-in ballot on election day. Will that show up as part of the initial uh, tabulation or is it something that it, it gets, you know, put in the back of the line and doesn't get counted um, until farther, uh, deeper in the process? So the supervisors process those vote by mail ballots as soon as they come in. And that is, an, that is an important distinction about Florida. Some states, even states that have vote by mail, don't allow those ballots to be canvassed until election day. So that obviously is going to put them very behind on getting those, those ballots canvassed if they can't start until actual election day. Here, 
our supervisors of election can start canvassing those ballots much earlier. And in fact, one of the things that Governor DeSantis did in response to the pandemic was give extra days for supervisors to begin that canvassing. So as soon as they finish that pre-election audit that we talked about earlier, they can start processing and canvassing those um, vote by mail ballots. If the ballot is received on election day, I know that the supervisors are prepared to try to work through those ballots real time as they're coming in. Uh, and the question of whether they will be part of that initial release of results that comes out right when the polls close uh, probably just depends on the volume of ballots that come in that day. I know in the primary, they were, I believe all of them, if not almost all of them, were actually able to keep up with the uh, vote by mail, it's, mail ballots coming in and were caught up through you know, the day before election day and were only processing the ones that actually came in on election day that day. Uh, but it will likely depend on how many come in the day before and the day of, whether it falls into that already tabulated initial number or rolls into later that night. Great. And, and I know, just kind of speaking about that, I know that a lot of people will be glued to their television or yes. their internet browser on election night to see what the results are. Does, the, does your office run sort of a master um, a database or a master website that helps people track elections in real time? We sure do. We have the Florida Election Watch website, uh, and that aggregates uh, what we see coming in and presents all of that information for voters. So, of course, you can go county by county and look at information, uh, but we do have an Election Watch website for exactly that purpose. One thing that's important to remember about that, though, is that Florida does have two time zones. So we do not start reporting anything about outcomes until our second time zone up here in the panhandle has reported their results. So that's 8 p.m. Eastern time, not 7 p.m. Eastern time. Good point, good point. And my recollection from past presidential elections is that sometimes there will be a line at a polling place when it's supposed to close. So it may take a little while after the official polls closing because they don't shut off the line and say you can't vote. They, they count the folks who are in line. Is that correct? That's exactly right. If you're in line at seven o'clock, you'll still be able to vote. Great. Great. So um, amazingly, time has gone really fast. We only have time for uh, for one more question, and it's uh, it's from John. So uh, for absentee ballots, mail-in ballots, when are they sent out to residents who may not be in the state right now? So if you're somebody who's a Florida resident, but you requested a mail-in ballot um, to a different location because for whatever reason, um, have those already gone out? Are they going out now? Do they go out later? When did those happen? They, they are going out as we speak. Uh, some of them have already been mailed. They typically will go out in batches, depending on how many uh, a particular supervisor is mailing, but they are going out as we speak. So they should be coming uh, to, to you fairly shortly. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, sorry, apparently I'm getting a call from a political campaign. The um, <laughs> <laughs> As it goes. So uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I do want to say we had more questions than we have time to answer, and we will follow up working with uh, Secretary Lee's office to make sure we get answers to every question that was asked in the chat. I appreciate all those who participated and, and, who, um, and who raised their questions because it's very important to have full confidence that this, this election is going to go really well. Secretary And certainly, you've spent with us um, today as well. So, uh, any final comments from uh, you, Secretary Lee, before we let folks go? Yes, and that is, I, I will say, I'm absolutely happy to. I know we did not get to all of the questions, uh, but we want to. So any questions that are still in that chat box that we didn't get to answer, uh, we will certainly work with Jeff to make sure that uh, we get any information that you need. Uh, and again, just know that we're a resource. Your supervisor's a resource. Uh, you know, elections are partisan. Election administration is not. We want every Floridian to go to the polls uh, this presidential election, knowing that they can have absolute confidence in the entire integrity of our process and that we're working very hard to protect every voter and to protect their vote. So I just appreciate you having me. You're an incredibly important uh, demographic for us here in Florida, and I'm honored to get to participate. 
Thank you. Thanks so much. And, and again, final thank yous to all those who made this happen, both in the Secretary's office and the folks behind the scenes at ARP who have been working the levers to make this go. Appreciate everybody's time today and hope everybody stays safe and uh, and, and enjoys giving the uh, having the opportunity to, to cast their vote in this election. Take care, all. Thank you.